So um, this is going to be a bit of a departure for me. Um, things are changing at Crossref, and uh, we're in the midst of this transition. And so you're going to recognize a few of the slides from past presentations that I've done um, at these annual meetings. Um, but, um, but this is probably going to be the last time you see uh, this format because, um, because it is going to change. Now, if you um, recall, uh, for the past few years, I've gone through and started these presentations by talking about something that we call the Strategic Initiatives Lifecycle. This is something that I wrote up um, when I first joined Crossref, and it was designed to, dis uh, to describe the process that we would use uh, for vetting uh, new projects, uh, allocating funds and resources to them, and moving them up from, uh, from conception through to, uh, to development and production. And, um, and I used to accompany this slide with a, uh, another one, which um, I just have to give uh, Ginny a sort of a heads up because it's going to cause her a heart attack when she sees it. Um, but something that looked like this. Um, that would talk about um, all the uh, projects and uh, where they were on this timeline and what weird name I'd invented for it and what strange logo I'd created um, for it at the time. And um, I've, uh, I've, I've been told I can't do that anymore. Um, uh, Chuck and I are under strict orders to not invent new product names um, and to not uh, uh, create new logos and for crying out loud to stop please stop uh, designing interfaces. Um, and uh, these are all things of which I uh, heartily approve. Um, so I'm going to try uh, and not use any of these logos this time. And I'm going to try and talk about uh, things uh, at a little more abstract level. Uh, it's hard to talk about things without giving them names, though, and particularly as the names are changing. But um, the basic model uh, remains at the moment, uh, which is that we have projects that go from concept development all the way up through production. And um, one of the things that we're going to be working on uh, over the next few years, is, as, uh, I mean, sorry, over the next few years, over the next few months, uh, as Jennifer indicated, is, is we're going to be tying this to a real product development um, uh, process. So it's no longer going to be uh, Chuck and Jeffrey dream up something because they talk to someone and we put something on the site and give it a name and put it out there. Um, we're going to try and tightly integrate these things. We're going to actually design them. We're going to actually treat these things uh, like real products. Um, and so consequently, I'm not going to show you the logos uh, at the moment. Again, this is a transition period, so these names are, are probably going to change. But if you looked at that, um, that chart, that thing with the horrible graphics on it and so on and so forth, it really roughly translates into this. Um, and it shows uh, what products have come out of uh, our strategic initiatives and have gone on and are now in production. And that's everything from CrossCheck to uh, CrossMark, ORCID, um, and a few other things that sort of sit behind the scenes and that you might not really think about uh, much, but things like content negotiation um, and the REST API and other uh, tools uh, that are heavily used uh, by the community. And then we've got some things here uh, that are in incubation, that is that they're things that we uh, worked on for a while um, and uh, to see if they get any traction. Um, and they're still there and they are still working, but they haven't moved for a while and we're sort of looking at them and trying to decide what to do with them in the longer term. Um, we've got some things that are actively in development, the DOI event tracker, the distributed usage logging that's been mentioned earlier and that you might have heard about yesterday at the workshops, um, and, um, and a few other things which I'm going to talk about in the future. So you can see we've got a pipeline still uh, of things moving up from concept development into, uh, into production, but the big thing, uh, and I hope next year when I'm up here talking about it, is that this is really going to be tied into an overall uh, product strategy uh, that brings a lot more unity to these things and links them together and uh, hopefully doesn't come up with the silly names for them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the past year. Um, and it, it was a year that started um, in a very awkward fashion. Um, I don't know how many of you were aware of this on January 20th, but um, a, a pretty important strategic issue was surfaced on that day. And uh, that strategic issue was that uh, the doi.org domain went down. Um, and that in turn meant that um, DOI resolution was interrupted for about 48 hours. 
Um, and, um, and we had to deal with the aftermath of that. And one of the big things that I've been doing ever since is um, analyzing uh, the, uh, why that happened, uh, what we can do in order to avoid it in the future, and some other things. But roughly what happened was this. Um, uh, CNRI, which is an organization that runs the handle system, which in turn is the technology upon which DOI is based, um, uh, forgot to renew DOI.org. Um, and that uh, they remembered the day that it was supposed to be renewed, and they did renew it about, uh, it seems, about 30 minutes after it expired. Um, but consequently, what happened that day was that um, in half the world, the DOI.org domain was expiring, and in the other half of the world, it was being renewed. And so throughout the world, we got uh, tweets and messages saying, what the heck's going on? Uh, why has Crossref failed us? Um, uh, how are we going to ever you know, trust uh, this claim of persistent identifiers again? And um, when we did finally discover what had happened and we, we kept in touch with, with, with the community and let them know what we knew and, and got them up to speed and told them what was happening, you know, it, it finally it sort of um, it, it, it did peter out. And we got a lot of appreciation, I think, for the fact that we kept people informed. But it did illustrate a number of things to us, one of which is that because we're the largest DOI registration agency and the one that most people know, everybody assumed that uh, it was us uh, that was in control of this. Um, and they assumed that we were the people who could fix it, and in fact, uh, we weren't. Um, this was a dependency that we had and, um, and one that we had a l uh, little control over. Um, we promised the audience at the time that we'd write a report about this, uh, that we'd analyze both the technical and potential technical solutions to trying to avoid this kind of problem in the future, um, and that we'd also analyze some of the social uh, constructs that were here, that, 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 that dependencies that we had there. Um, at the time, I described uh, the DOI system as, um, uh, as turtles all the way down. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this is a quote, uh, I think, made famous by to uh, Terry Pratchett in his Discworld series in which um, there's a planet, um, and uh, the planet, um, kids ask, so how does the planet get uh, held into space? And the answer is, well, it's on four elephants. And then the children ask, well, what are the four elephants standing on? And they say, oh, a giant tortoise. And, uh, and then they ask, what's the giant tortoise standing on? And the answer is, oh, after that, it's turtles all the way down. And what it's supposed to indicate is that there are just these sort of infinite regresses of dependency uh, that exist. So if you look at this diagram, we have a bunch of registration agencies at the top, Crossref, Datasite, Medra, others. Um, and we're all dependent uh, to some extent on the International DOI Foundation, which in turn is dependent on ICANN, which in turn, I mean, sorry, dependent on CNRI, which in turn is dependent on ICANN. And it goes down. So if any of these sort of dependencies there fails, um, we're, we can be in trouble as well. And in this case, it was you know, a, a, an administrative error. It could have happened to any of us. It's happened to a huge organizations that passed Microsoft, Apple. They've all forgotten to renew domain names. You can't snigger and, you know, and, 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 and say, oh, well, nobody would do that. Um, CNRI was devastated that this happened. They've responded quickly. But nonetheless, it was a problem, right? And it illustrated a vulnerability of the system, and we needed to deal with that, and we needed to analyze it. Um, so one thing I do recommend, you know, we, when we went and we looked at this, we, we had to give a report to the board and sort of explain what happened and what we were going to do about it. And we came up with, you know, a number of options which we're exploring and continuing to explore, including simple things like just making it easier to figure out, for, for people to figure out what's going on, right? So they don't have to tweet us to find out what's down, what's up. They might be able to go to a dashboard to see what it is that, that might be causing problems. Um, other possibilities were, um, of course, DOI.org uh, didn't work because it hadn't been renewed. That didn't mean the handle system wasn't working. And so if you knew that there was another handle proxy with a different domain name, such as DOI.crossref.org, you could have resolved your DOIs anyway. Um, but a lot of people didn't know that, but maybe it would be good practice for us to establish that as something that we do in the standard. Um, parallel resolution technology, right? So maybe we should actually see about using something like Handle that runs in parallel to the system just in case the Handle system does go down for some other reason uh, in the future. Um, and then there are sort of more extreme and possibly fanciful things like partitioning ICANN to treat uh, the DOI.org domain as 
fundamental internet infrastructure, um, and um, and there are precedents for such domains, and they have different rules about uh, you know things like domain expo uh, exp expiry and stuff like that. So we presented to this this to the board, and the board asked us actually to look at one other option, which was uh, remove the dependencies. And um, I think that this is not something that we are actually seeking to do. I think this is an exercise um, that we've been asked to perform mostly in order to understand what the dependencies are and where they are. Um, but it is something that we're exploring, and it's something that we will probably, uh, that we will write a report on. And as we do it, we're going to both look at the technical dependencies and also uh, at the social dependencies I mentioned. One of the things that we've done since then as an experiment and uh, just uh, to, to fulfill some of the promises that we made is we've been working with the California Digital Libraries, uh, John Kunze over there. Uh, they have a resolution technology that works very much like handles. And we, uh, as a demonstrator, thought it would be interesting to load up that system with 75 million DOIs uh, in order to show that you could actually use a different parallel uh, resolution infrastructure. So uh, they have this technology called uh, end to T or name to thing. Um, and uh, we uploaded this DOI resolution information. And now um, as an experiment, again, this is not a production system. It's running on a test system. Uh, you can take any DOI and go to that and paste it just like you would have the handle system, and it will resolve. Um, and what it illustrates is that you know, this technology is not rocket science these days, um, and this is something that we could probably do, and it might be actually something fairly simple to do to provide backup for the system. Um, as I said, that's one technical issue. We're going to look at other things. But um, one of the other things we're doing is we're working with a, with a consultant to analyze the social dependencies that exist as well. So you saw the previous turtle diagram showing a bunch of uh, dependencies, uh, you know, I, uh, ID, uh, IDF depending on CNRI, depending on ICANN. But of course, there are also um, things that they've signed, right? They're members of other organizations. So for instance, the IDF is an ISO standard. So the DOI is governed by ISO in some, in, in some meaningful ways. And CNRI is actually um, uh, devolving uh, administration of the handle system to an organization called DONA. Um, and DONA is therefore going to be responsible for administering the, 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 the handle system. And they may create other handle providers in addition to CNRI. So we also have to understand some of these dependencies in order for us to truly understand what, you know, where the weakest spots are and what we can do to ameliorate them. This is not, this is going to be an ongoing process. Uh, I just want those people who saw this at the early, earlier in the year to know that we haven't forgotten about it. We're looking at it and there are going to be ongoing reports and ongoing work to try and figure out how we can minimize our risk here. Um, but this is really, um, again, as director of strategic initiatives, uh, if we're talking about the art of persistence, uh, kind of important and kind of strategic. So it's something that we are going to be working on. So that was a really kind of crappy start to the year, I have to say. Um, so let's put that behind us for a little bit and talk about some of the other things, move onward and talk about some of the cool projects that we are working on and that should see fruition or have seen fruition, has seen fruition uh, recently. One of the first areas of focus that we had at the beginning of the year was on data and publications. And all of us have sat probably in countless meetings now where people are saying, what can we do about making sure that uh, uh, publications link to data, that data is cited, that you can tell uh, all the data sets that a publication is cited, that you can look at a data set and find out what publications have referred to it. And there have been a huge number of initiatives launched uh, to try and address this issue, and it's discussed all over the place. Um, but one thing that we've observed is that there are two organizations that are really primarily placed in order uh, to deal with this problem, and that's Crossref and Datasite. And we've always worked very closely with Datasite. Um, they're a sister organization. They serve a slightly orthogonal community, but they're effectively doing the same thing, which is providing DOIs as citation identifiers to research objects. And, um, but one of the problems uh, in, in working with Datacite is that it is a very lean organization. It's quite small. And so they always had sort of capacity problems in being able to cooperate with us and, and collaborate and build uh, common tools and so on and so forth. So I'm glad to say that that's changed. Datacite's recently gotten a, a, an influx of, um, 
of funding, um, partly to, 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 to help it grow and to help it build its staff. And they've got some new excellent staff over there, Martin Fenner, who many of you probably know from other uh, venues, uh, Tricia Cruz, of course, who you also probably know uh, from her uh, history at CDL, and Laura Reda from, uh, from CERN. And the great news here is that now we're really actively collaborating with DataSite, and we're co-developing a lot of tools, including something that should see the light of day very soon, which is going to be um, the ability for you to take a Crossref DOI and find out what DataSite DOIs um, are related to it, or for you to take a DataSite DOI and find out what publications are related to it. We think that this is going to go a long way to answering some of the big problems that people have had about, you know, around data citation and things like that. But similarly, we're also engaged with a bunch of organizations that are also looking at other issues around data. So we've been members of the Research Data Alliance for a while and attending meetings there and making sure that they're aware of the developments that we're undertaking. Uh, we've been working with a group called RMAP um, that has been, uh, that, that uh, is a research initiative that um, the IEEE has been involved in fa with fairly closely, and we've been talking to them. More recently, uh, I've been invited to participate in another EU grant-funded uh, project called Open uh, Minted, uh, which is uh, dealing with issues of uh, text and data mining across large corpuses. And uh, we work a lot with Open Air as well, which is another European project uh, that overlaps with a lot of kind of stuff that we're doing. So we're really trying to make, our, make ourselves very well known in this industry so that we can, you know, if, if we don't need to create uh, duplicate infrastructure, if we don't need to do other things, you know, take advantage of the, of the things that are there, data site, Crossref, where possible. So we're really engaged in that. Another project that we kicked off very early in the year was with Wikipedia. Um, and I talked a little bit about uh, our, our work with Wikipedia last year, but this year it's really borne some fruit. Um, I mention Wikipedia because it's actually quite important to us. Uh, there was a bit of discussion about this yesterday, but Wikipedia is the fifth largest referrer of DOIs, um, uh, Crossref DOIs, after things like you know, Web of Knowledge, Serial Solutions, Science Direct, and Scopus. So it is a big driver of citations uh, to our content. And, um, and this is despite the fact that only a fraction of references in the uh, Wikipedia are linked um, and that a fraction of those are linked via DOIs. So it's really potentially a lot m bigger than this. Um, but we've been working with them because we get, you know, 25 to 30 referrals a day, uh, 30K referrals a day uh, from Wikipedia. Uh, last time we measured, this was increasing by about 2K a day. Um, and they're from all over the place. It's not just the English Wikipedias from all sorts of, uh, uh, from all the multiple language Wikipedias. So we've been working with the Wikipedia to try and capture information um, in as close to real time as possible about what activity is going on around DOIs in the Wikipedia. And this is ultimately all information that's going to feed into this DOI event tracker that we, we've already heard about and that we've talked about. But for the time being, we actually have a proof of concept set up where we're getting a live stream of data from the Wikipedia, and you can actually go and see in real time um, what, what people citing and funnily enough, unciting content in various Wikipedia properties. And you can see in this diagram here, I think there are probably like four DOI citation events in the past um, you know, few minutes, or five minutes or something like that. And I've, I've looked at this where I've seen like 15 to 30 uh, DOIs, uh, uh, DOI events occurring across the Wikipedias in a five minute span. That's incredible, the amount of activity. Uh, this is mesmerizing, by the way. Don't go to it because it's a time sink and you're not going to, like, leave. Um, but um, but it is, um, it's very interesting, and as I said, this is ultimately going to be uh, fed into the DOI um, event tracker. Related to that is just this notion, which I think is increasingly important to us, of understanding how scholarly literature is referred to uh, from outside of the scholarly literature. Um, you know, who is clicking on things, where are they coming from, and so on and so forth. So a uh, sort of an experiment, this is one of these incubator projects that we sort of put up to try and gauge interest and to understand the situation better. We developed something and launched it on Crossref Labs called the DOI Chronograph. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to look at the resolution information from non 
uh, from non-scholarly sources. That is, we take the resolution information that's provided to us from the handle system and we, um, and we basically take out all of the uh, scholarly sources that we already know about and we say, and you can go into this and you can do things like say, okay, well, show me the Wikipedia references or show me, you know, references, uh, the number of, uh, of things that have been followed from uh, Facebook or something else. You can put in any domain. And in this case, uh, we put in wikipedia.org and as you can see there, it gives you a sort of a, a picture of the traffic uh, from this snapshot of data. But this is giving us a better understanding of kinds of traffic that's being driven to your content, and it's giving us an idea of what kinds of things, when we're talking about the DOI event tracker and so on and so forth, we should be prioritizing. Another big thing that was talked about yesterday, and that is um, kind of like well-established now, Chuck mentioned this also, um, because it's just been recently moved into the, uh, into the production system, is our REST API. This is an API, you'll hear a little bit more about this later when Scott's talking, um, that a lot of uh, researchers and funders and libraries and publishers are using in order to make more efficient use of Crossref metadata. And, um, and it's been in existence for a while, but we keep making changes to it and updates to it in order to ac uh, accommodate new needs. And so uh, I encourage you, uh, if you've looked at it a few years, you know, months ago or whatever, to keep going back to api.crossref.org because we do keep adding uh, new filters and new ways of accessing um, the metadata. Um, uh, the big projects that we worked on this year uh, were collectively uh, went under the name for a long time of the DOI Event Tracker, or DET, as we like to call it, just to annoy Ginny. Um, and, um, but this project is now actually graduating um, from strategic initiatives into uh, product development and into um, and is one of the first large projects that is actually going to go through the proper product development and, um, and, and, and marketing process that we're putting into place. And as part of that, one of the big things that happened was that the, um, is that the product team and, um, and uh, the comms team looked at the, uh, looked at the DET and uh, realized that something that we'd done early on sort of as a, uh, you know, typically as sort of a geeky act of efficiency where we saw two things that had a similar technology base, so we decided to join them. Um, yes, they shared that technology base, but they were actually two separate use cases. Um, and one of them is what we're calling, still calling the DOI event tracker, which is this idea that we're going to collect data about events relating to DOIs uh, in a raw form and provide them to the community uh, for third parties or for publishers to analyze and aggregate and, and, and normalize and do all of those things, but to do so in an auditable, open, um, uh, portable way, right? That's the, the mission of the DOI event tracker uh, still. Um, but then there was another use case uh, that we were discussing in the same uh, vein, and that is slightly orthogonal, and that is that often um, third parties need to report data directly back to the publisher about usage. Um, and often this has to do with the fact that there might be private information that they're not allowed to make public, um, and they need to uh, convey that information r directly back to, uh, to, the, to the publisher. So, for example, some of the content uh, scholarly sharing networks that exist out there, the idea would be that using this mechanism, they might be able to re uh, report usage information to publishers about the content uh, that's being uh, used in the scholarly uh, sharing networks. Um, Again, I uh, recommend that if you want sort of an update about this, that you go to our blog uh, where we wrote about uh, this and we'll be soon writing about the d distributed usage uh, logging uh, project um, and you'll get a lot more uh, detail uh, about the pro problem uh, program there and you'll be able to sign up for more information and things like that. Another project that's making its way through, uh, through strategic initiatives is something we've talked about for a while, linked clinical trials. And the idea simply here, we've got a working group who's interested in making sure that just as we're now collecting funding information and ORCID information when uh, researchers are submitting manuscripts, that it would be a very good idea, for instance, if we uh, collected clinical trial registration information as well. 
Um, and the idea here is that um, often it's very hard to track what follow-up research has been done on registered clinical trials. And, um, and so if they collect this information and distribute it um, via Crossref, then it will be easier to link various articles that refer to the same clinical trial. And the, the problem here is twofold. Um, one is, how do we collect this information? Uh, do the publishers enter it, or do they uh, delegate that to the authors? If they delegate it to the authors, how, how are they going to, um, you know, what's the interface that they're going to use that's going to make that easy? Um, and um, if they do it themselves, what can we do to make it easier for them to, for editors um, and the, for the publisher to add that information to the metadata? So we're doing two things. One, we're experimenting with a user interface that will allow uh, publishers to either uh, provide this clinical, meta, uh, this clinical uh, uh, trial information themselves or to, uh, for the publishers to send a form to the author where they can fill out the clinical trial information and it will ge be reintegrated in the Crossref metadata. Some other publishers are going to actually just bypass that. They're going to either use a manual process in-house and then directly deposit this stuff. Um, but we're experimenting with, with both models because we expect that some publishers will want to do one thing and some the other. And so that project's just entering pilot at the moment. Um, we are collecting information from some publishers using this interface. Other publishers are going to be start depositing um, uh, the, the, the data directly as soon as the schema is in place. Um, the idea behind this, and this is a, an example of the interface that can be used, that's being used to gather information about clinical trials, but the idea is that ultimately, once we've gathered this information, it's information that can be exposed via Crossmark. Um, so, for instance, you could go into Crossmark and open it and look at the record tab and see that um, all the other publications that were linked to uh, the clinical trials that were mentioned in the publication that you're looking, linking, looking at. And uh, it's going to take us a little while longer to uh, work on this part of the, uh, of the project because it requires a lot of thought about the user interface and the, the direction that Crossmark is going in. So, uh, so, this, so this part is going to take a little while longer uh, for us to work on. Um, finally, another project that you've heard about and that we're making a, a big push on this year is what uh, we're now calling self-repairing DOIs. Again, this is sort of a, a, a side effect of the product development process that's been brought in, which uh, we had this project that we used to call OPSIT, and uh, it turns out it really is trying to deal with two different use cases, um, both of which use the same technology. But the first use case that we're going to be working with here uh, is, is the use case of small publishers. We've heard, um, we've heard Martin Eve talk about the problems that small publishers face participating in Crossref. We've heard Juan talk about them. But to recap, you know, about um, uh, the vast majority of our members who are new members who are joining uh, have under a million dollars in revenue, so they're playing, paying about $275 in uh, membership fees. Uh, they're small. They're open access. Uh, they're from brick and developing countries. And also importantly to note is that although we've kept the lid on our prices um, and our costs, and in real terms, our, the costs of participating in Crossref have gone down over the years. It's still a heck of a lot of money uh, to play this game if you're not in the U.S. If, or in Western Europe. Um, and this is sort of like adjusted uh, cost of Crossref in, in various countries based on uh, the same amount. So um, the problem to summarize uh, here is that small publishers um, – don't have the technical resources to update their UR, their DOIs. They sometimes don't even know they have to do that. They have this sort of auto-magical concept that DOIs are just persistent. Um, they haven't really grokked the social aspect of updating these things. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to have them not have to think about that. Right? And in order to do that, what we're proposing, because a lot of these publishers are open access, is that we're going to offer a special kind of DOI that they can use, uh, which allows them, you know, which will work normally. This is the Journal of Psychoceramics, by the way. The Journal of Psychoceramics um, was uh, Josiah Carberry, who was the first Ig Nobel winner. And I'm, I'm surprised that Mark, uh, that wasn't mentioned earlier today. But anyway, um, links will work normally. Um, but if a small publisher makes a mistake, they kick out the plug on their server or they move it or they forget to update their URLs or they redesign their site or something like that, what we'll do is when they register the DOI, we'll automatically make a copy of it uh, in an archive or in several archives. And then if the link breaks, 
um, what we'll do is automatically detect that that link is broken and redirect to the archive for as long as the link is broken. If the link is repaired, the publisher either redeposits the metadata or brings their server back up or something like that, um, then, of course, we'll redirect back to the original. So the idea here is that for those publishers who aren't, you know, don't have the technical resources to do this kind of thing, we're going to provide them with a mechanism that, that, that helps them keep these links working. And we think this is important to all of us because if we have a bunch of publishers out there who aren't updating their links and, who are, and, and we increasingly have broken DOIs, it's going to reflect badly on all of us. So we want to make sure that these things work. And in the case of these small publishers, there's something easy we think we can do. Finally, another big project that we're working on, and I realize I'm three minutes over time. i sorry about this. I'll quickly end. This is the last thing. Um, we're working on something called participation reports. Uh, one of the big changes in Crossref over the years has been that in the early days of Crossref, when really mostly what we were doing was resolving uh, DOIs um, and um, taking and, you know, and, um, and, and linking them, um, if a publisher didn't provide adequate metadata or complete metadata. Um, the person who suffered the most from that was the publisher who wasn't providing the, the complete metadata because what it meant was that people couldn't find links to their content and couldn't link DOIs to their content and, and traffic wasn't driven to their content. But as we come up with more projects, right, where it's increasingly important that the metadata be correct and that the metadata be complete and that as many publishers are participating in the project as possible, then the dynamic becomes a bit different. Um, so, for instance, Fundref is um, useful in direct proportion to the number of participants who are doing it, the number of participants who are doing it correctly, um, and, um, and so it's increasingly important not just for publishers to know that they're doing it correctly, but for the other stakeholders who are, increasing, who are asking to depend on these systems to know that these things are being done correctly. Um, the first question that we ask if we go and we talk to a funder and we say that there's this fund ref thing and they can use it is, well, who's participating in it? How well are they doing? Are they recording the correct information? And so on and so forth. And increasingly we have things like this ORCID, uh, the text and data mining stuff that we've been doing. Uh, these are the questions that keep getting raised. So one of the things we're trying to do is provide an easy way for publishers and for other stakeholders to understand who's participating in what and to what degree they're participating. So that they have a good idea of how effective the prog uh, uh, projects are going to be. I lied. There is one last thing that we're working on. Sorry about that. DOIs on acceptance. This has been mentioned before. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been telling people is that they should, uh, for, for the past um, 15 years, is that they should um, d uh, deposit their DOIs soon after making their content available online. Um, uh, but increasingly, that's not good enough. Um, and there are two major use cases um, that we keep seeing. One is when we have people who are issuing press releases about um, articles that, are, you know, that, are, that they want a lot of publicity for, and they want to send out links to people ahead of time. Um, if they uh, don't think that the DOI is going to be registered in time, they don't send the DOI. They send uh, another link, uh, a plain ordinary URL to the users. If they do send a DOI to the press, then sometimes what happens is that when they make the announcement, people following the DOI don't find the content because it hasn't gone through the registration process yet. So one of the things we're trying to do is try and provide a mechanism whereby uh, to, we can encourage publishers to actually deposit their DOIs before content is made online. Uh, if they need to do so with minimal metadata, they can do so. Uh, but then this way we can ensure that the DOI will at least do something, even if it says come back later when the content is available. Um, the second use case that we're seeing is that we're seeing a lot of um, uh, funders and institutions uh, uh, asking for uh, asking publishers to notify them at acceptance when uh, when content is available uh, when sorry when something has been accepted and um, and what this mean and what this often means is that the content has been accepted but it's not yet available online. And so we want to have some sort of a mechanism for dealing with that situation where content um, has been accepted, somebody needs to be notified, they're going to be sent to DOI, and we don't want that DOI to just be broken. We want to go to, go to something that tells them at least something about what's going to show up there eventually so that they can, um, so that, uh, again, the DOI system is preserved. Um, finally, um, 
Uh, if you want to find out more about what's going on, as was mentioned earlier, Crosstech is dead. Long live Crosstech. Uh, it's been renamed to blog.crossref.org. Um, the same content is in there, uh, but it is now a general purpose blog, but we will continue to use it for updating people on, on new initiatives. And then, of course, the other place that you can go and look at projects and experiments of ours is labs.crossref.org. Finally, uh, my, uh, uh, my team is here. Uh, there's Carl Ward, uh, who you can locate and ask questions. He's working on uh, the API, the search engine, and other things. And, uh, and there's um, uh, Joe Wass, who's also here and is working on things like the DET, the OI event tracker, and the Wikipedia stuff. And of course, I'm here as well and happy to answer any questions. Uh, but we have a break, so.